Cozy Gloves here, and today I'm going to show you how to do some mixing. The question was, it was a requested tutorial, someone wanted to know how can I take a drum loop that sounds like this and use Studio Drummer. I actually mentioned Studio Drummer, but any sort of drum library that tries to emulate, or not emulate, this is a really great emulation, I guess if you could call it that, but uh, any studio library kit thing that is supposed to sound like a real drum kit, basically, so you can like, you know, replace a drummer or whatever. Not that it replaces drummers, of course, but well, I mean, you know, there's lots of opinions to fly there, but okay, so it has sounded like that before. And at the end, it sounds like this. So how can I make, you know, basically use it to enhance my drum loops? Now I'm going to be showing you a number of mixing tricks. I do have some basses in here just for the sake of showing you all of this in action. Here it is. So of course, not done. It's got some interesting things, but mixing gets a lot more complicated as soon as you start tossing more stuff in. So we're going to focus on the drum loop principally. So first, let's go to the kick. And now I'm going to be brushing over just a hodgepodge of sort of mixing ideas and tips because if I were to try and like systematically break this down in a way that like you would be like a mixing master at the end, we would be here all day. So first, I have uh, two kicks I ha because they wanted to know how can they use uh, that to enhance the synthetic uh, sampled more typically sampled kicks now the thing about it is I kind of just went with whatever kick I had first so if I turn off everything except so this was the original just a sampled kick and with this is just the uh, acoustic kick So a thing about acoustic kicks, as you record more and more kicks, you'll learn, especially as you mix more songs, how they sort of fit together, what kind of acoustic kicks, uh, miking, all that stuff, sort of a choice here. So I just sort of went with the first kick. This is sort of a floppy kick. So it, I was like, oh, I don't know where this is going to go. But I think I got it pretty tight sounding, uh, especially compared to where it was. So where it was, let's do that. So uh, if I come in here... So I'm going to be using Studio Drummer for all this. So I, what I do, and if you've never mixed, you know, you know, like normal songs, not like just not EDM songs, like songs that you actually have to record your stuff. You're not using samples to do everything. You're going to get, usually you'll get a kick track, a snare track. And remember, all these mics are on the kit at the same time. So you're going to have bleed. Um, if, I'm just saying that because some of you guys have honestly never dealt with real bleed before, except for maybe on vocals. And... So you have a, a kick snare and maybe two over a stereo overhead. So you have two overhead tracks and, uh, and then whatever else, toms, toms, cymbals, stuff like that. Uh, maybe a hi-hat, you know, it just depends. So what's, what's interesting about that is the way you have to mix it. So I went about it that way. So I have a kick and then I've got my snare on a separate one. And what you'll typically do is you'll gate it, do a whole load of other things. We're not going to talk about any of that because I don't think that's what that person was looking for. We're just going to assume you can get your kick pretty well by itself. So I decided to use and take advantage of the mixer inside here. And this is only the kick. I duplicated it for the snare and for the hi-hat. And I left out toms and stuff because that's more, just more. So this stuff is like, seriously, you could sit here all day fin finessing things. This is, this is what I really like to do, but it's difficult to explain sometimes because it's pretty uh, specific. And a lot of these ideas are just that. They're just ideas according to whatever you're currently doing. So here I'm going to be using the GEQ, the Transient Master, no compressor. I would rather use the compressor after you know, I'd rather use Maximus as a multiband expander compressor and then I'm using the tape warmth if I turn these things off and I'm leaving the post effects on so it sounds like this and yeah uh, that's not gonna fly so I went for these things ah so as you see that's quite an improvement and uh, sometimes you're just going to work with whatever you're handed but if you're doing your own stuff and you have a luxury this is with uh, now this is Here's the the synthetic. This is the sample I went with. It sounds like that. And that's really, really solid too. They're both going into five. Five has a multiband maximus. If I turn off these, they are sorely lacking. I turn it back on. They are not sorely lacking anymore. They have a lot of kick and punch. And I want to show you some of the powers that these guys have together. 
Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up a new pattern. We're just going to start afresh. I'll also cover the snare and stuff. I'm not the biggest fan of the way this snare turned out. I'd probably go in and do some more snare sample digging, but we'll cover those things. So first we're going to, you know, open up a new contact. So we're going to hit F8, type in, you know, contact and load up. Waiting for contact. There we go. You're going to right click because, of course, you have your quick load option. You go to drums, session kit full for studio drummer. And you right click again to get rid of that menu. And bang, it's loaded up. Look at that. I didn't have to go into anywhere. I'm getting more and more used to it. And the more used to it I get, the more I like it. Okay, so studio drummer and most other drum libraries, especially if you own contact, have various options that you should be aware of. Usually they have a mixer. And they have, it's really nice. They have the solid G. It's a very famous equalizer. I'm currently working on a, uh, ch -ch 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 a duality console and it has a solid G E Q option. And so I'm, I, I quite like this. It's very nice. If you've never used an EQ, a lot of you people, EDM people probably are used to seeing spectrums when you use EQ. One of the great things about this is you do not have spectrum. So you got to know, you got to, you got to mix like, you know, they used to mix and it's really nice. Sounds really great. Very special EQ. It's kind of hard to explain to you how it sounds without doing like an EQ shootout where I run signal through multiple EQs and we see how they sound different uh, given the same parameters. But we're not going to deal with that right now. But we're going to be using this. We're going to be using the Transient Master, which is a native instrument. Sings. It's a special type of compressor. We're going to not use that compressor. We're going to use the tape saturator because tape saturation is kind of cool. And what we're going to do is first we're going to... If you're not familiar with this, they have this setting option over here and they have the mix mics. Now you might be thinking, where's the reverb unit? Because if you hit your kick, which I believe is like C, a second. Yeah, it's C5. It technically it should be like, it's not technically the MIDI spec, but whatever, you know? So we're going to put them down. And you hear all that extra bleed from the other mics that they have set up here because they were super cool and did that. So what we're going to do is this is the overheads. And so we're going to turn off the overheads. And they have a room mic as well, which is really another great thing. It's a really good sounding room mic too. Well, it better be for like the quality of sample library this is. So now without that stuff, we get this. So, okay, that sounds uh, still got some rings. So what we have is we have an in mic, an out mic, and a sub mic. And what you do is you get a mix you kind of like. I'm kind of okay with that. Maybe turn that one up. Okay. Now you see that the snare, even though we're doing the kick, the snare channel activates. And you might be going, what the junk? Well, it's called bleed, bro, dude. So what you do is we're just going to turn off these other ones. Uh, Hi-hats. I'm not sure what these other ones are. It's, mo it's just a snare for whatever reason. So, okay. Now, we've got our kick by itself. It's kind of a... You hear that? I call it plasticky sound. The, the beater hitting the head of the drum. It's just a floppy sounding kick. And so what we're going to do, we're going to clean up that kick now. So, first we're going to go over to compressor. I hope this uh, audio is loud enough for you to hear now that I'm thinking about it. We'll find out, I guess. So, first we're going to go to the EQ, which is way over here. Uh, which we can change that. I want to change the signal flow of this real fast. So we're going to take this and what are my options? EQ, compressor, transient tape. Cool. That's the one we want. I want to do that one. So we're going to EQ at first. You might be saying, why do we EQ at first? Well, my you have an EQ before and after your compressor because you want to EQ the crap out. That way when you compress it, you compress what you want to compress and then you then EQ it again. And that EQ is a tonally shaping EQ. I'm not going to worry too much about levels right now. I just want to get a good timbre. Um, and for you people who flip out about clipping because you're out there, uh, we are dealing with floating point audio. So theoretically, I could clip every freaking channel and just turn down the master bus. Now, there are all sorts of issues that you guys might point out quite academic-like and actually very useful-like too. If you hit like a compressor, which is in here, I have a limiter on my master bus. So if you run something like that, it will augment the way it sounds. So it is kind of important that we keep an eye and make sure things don't clip. But when we're sweeping and EQing, we should be relatively okay. Just make sure you're not monitoring too loud. And what we're going to do is first, we're going to look at the low frequency. We're Actually, we're going to touch every single one of these bands because I just like this EQ a lot. We're going to tighten up this EQ, I mean, this uh, thing. So we're going to turn Transient Master off. That way we get 
just what the EQ is doing and we're not influenced anything else down the chain. And so what we're going to do is usually this stuff, we're going to turn it on bell and I'm not even going to talk about why we're going to do that. We're just going to use bell because of filter reasons. And we're going to this, we're going to set the boost up and we're going to sweep. Not, we're not going to go up too far. We're going to stay down here in the low end, kind of look for the punch. We're going to boost quite dramatically. So we have some, then we're going to just tone it back. I don't like that move. We got some sort of boom. Let's see if we can run with the boom. You see we clipped right there too. They have clipping in here. How cool is that? So next we're going to go for our low mid frequencies. We're going to boost these. We're going to have a Q. It's relatively in the middle. And we're going to cut. You hear that's kind of, that stuff is just sort of, it's, it creates a, it eats headroom is basically what it does. And it creates like a, people call it sort of boxy four or 500 hertz range. And this is 0 0.2 meaning 200 hertz. This is 2K meaning 2000 hertz. So we're going to bring that down. We're going to cut it out. And we immediately just sound way more tight. We're going to go up to the high and we're going to look for snap. And well, most people call it like the snap usually resides somewhere in 1k 2k range oh you know what the other issues are cues far too wide you want to be careful I'm okay with that you want to be careful where you place resonances in your tracks because you need to be mindful of the arrangement, which is why this is a really complicated topic. You have to be mindful of the arrangement. Uh, what key even? You don't want to sit this on top of a note. Maybe you do on top of the main note, the main frequency of your song, the key of your song. So it's like C, you want to be, you know, maybe look up what frequency C is and avoid that resonance is there or maybe put them there to reinforce that note like whatever your sort of philosophy about the whole thing is this last one we're going to turn on to bell as well we're going to boost and we're going to actually take out some of this because we're going to reinforce it with another kick later so we don't care about having high end air too much it's just going to eat up headroom and for other instruments and create masking and noise problems as it builds up later so We're not going to cut too much. Okay, so, whoops, I don't know why I did that. You can hear the difference, though. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to use the EQ. Here's before. It's like, uh, and here's after. Next up, we're going to go to our transient master. We're going to turn it on. We're going to turn our sustain down. Our sustain, a transient master basically can detect the transient and affect that while leaving the body of it relatively alone. If we turn it up, it turns our sustain way up. We don't want that. We want a really, really clean kick for, for this particular example. It's what I'm going for. Maybe you want a different kind of kick, so you'll do this different. But I'm going to turn up my attack. And then the last thing we're going to do is we're going to go to tape. We're going to turn on tape. And we're just going to add a little bit of gain. We're going to add some warmth and the high frequencies are going to bring down where our snap was, which is way down here, actually. You want to be careful because this can augment the tuning of your drum, too. So that's pretty much that. Without effects. With effects. And you see, we still have some headroom. We can change that later. Like that's not too big a deal. So that's what we got right now. So, okay, really great. There's a couple other things we should be aware of. We have our decay pretty far up over here. So we're gonna take that down on our kick instrument. And then we're solid. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna send it to a mixer track. I'm gonna move this one apart. And we're gonna name this one to kick. And now we are going to add 
a, we already EQ'd. So we're gonna add another, now I'm gonna use this one as a multiband expander, Maximus. I have a part, I have a whole thing on FL12 effects on how to do this. So I wanna add so, a little bit of sustain, which this, as you can see, that is a dramatic difference. And you see our transient is now being, it's sort of like shaping our transient as well, which is kind of cool. Next up, this is a really important one. This one will determine, now what's crazy is how soft our mid range is on this particular kick. So your mid range will make a big impact. So we're gonna do that. I'm gonna not boost the, the, the soft stuff. Now, what I'm doing right here It's a little complicated because you would think this is volume, but it's not technically volume. But watch, just watch my Maximus series, and I'm not even going to try explaining this because Maximus, that's why I have a series for it. It's, it's freaking complicated. We're going to do a very similar idea with this. We're not going to do too much on these. So without Maximus... See, that's quite quite a different change. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take this kick right here and we're going to hit Alt-C to clone it and we're going to hold down Shift and scroll our mouse wheel to bring it down. Or you can hit um, Alt and push up or down on your keyboard to do that. And we're going to add a, a kick on every four. Four. Oh, my bad. Oh, I forgot that I was dealing with... Uh, I had this different earlier. Whatever, we're going to add a kick on. Now you see, this is already a process thing. So we're gonna undo the processing right now. The sample I settled on was this sample and we're gonna move this right up to our kick too. And it sounds like this. So that's what the kick sounded like originally. This was after. As you can see, it's very, very sort of intense. So what we're going to do actually is I'm going to set it on the same track because I don't care too much. I want it to go through the similar processing. I'm not going to get like crazy right now. If I was getting really crazy, I would have it on a separate channel and maybe, and you notice here I have, I'm also molting outputs and doing things on those and blending them back in. So there's all this like other stuff going on with the compositional and arrangement side too. So right now we get that. So when I send it through the same uh, effect, I get a dramatically different sound than if it's on its own track. So it's all it's going through is Maximus and Addition. I'm going to turn it down and sort of look for a good level where they mix well. One of the things I noticed right off the bat, though, is this sustain is rather long. So I'm going to change the volume envelope on it. And I'm going to set it by ear. I want some sustain, but I want it to be sort of a tight, fast punch because uh, that was the style I was going for. You might have a different choice. This is up to you. Now we're going to mess with the volume. What the heck? Is this one softer? When it plays the first kick, that one is softer. There we go, that's why. That's, now we get really advanced to talk about how to use velocities and stuff dynamically according to how it will hit your signal chain, but that's like, that's just, that might be out of the realm of some of you guys. So I'm gonna just leave it alone for right now. Okay, so I'm pretty happy with this. Now here's where it gets kind of cool. So kicks are sort of, thought of as being this mysterious beast. Now, they're not mysterious beasts, and we're gonna load up on this channel. So with it selected, I'm gonna hit F8. We're gonna load up the, the EQ, parametric EQ, whoops, uh, two. Which is right there, and there it is, loaded up. So we, I just want this after. Uh, and let's go back to our kick. One of the ways to change the way your kick sounds, especially if you're layering kicks, huge tonal options, is if you simply move the pitch down by holding control, it'll slightly shift it. And technically it is a chorus effect, but it's a stagnant chorus effect. It, what it's doing is it's changing the way the phases line up because it's happening so fast. I wouldn't really call it a chorus effect because a kick, it has a pitch, but it 
doesn't have a pitch at the same time. So if you go watch my video on how chorus effects work if you're wondering why I'm drawing that connection at all. So what we're going to do is we're going to move this pitch knob and time stretch it a little bit. It's going to keep it in time. Oh, you know what? This wouldn't be a chorus effect because the time stretching, this is just pitch shifting. I don't know what I'm talking about. Chorus effect though. Yeah, go check it out. Uh, if it wasn't being time stretched, the same effect would still, a similar effect would happen and a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. But we're going to change the pitch, which will change the phase of this, which will change the way they sum. So we can get huge tonal options here. So let me just quit talking and play a little bit and I'll show you as I move this. And what we're going to look for is something that works well. You'll find they're going to come back here and mess with this when you're doing your arrangement to better match the key of the song you're in. So I'm okay with that for now. What the heck? So we have this going on. It's sort of a cool thing. And what we're going to do is we're going to start writing out a basic drum loop. So I'm just going to call that good for the kick for now. And we're going to go, you know, uh, I actually have to have the piano roll open for this one. Do da. Do da. There we go. And do, and then, oh, this is off by a little bit. Okay. Oh, you know what? After listening to it with them both. Yeah, I could spend all day. So I'm going to resist the urge to continue touching that. But you could seriously finesse it. Come back in here. Your mids are going to be largely responsible for the punch. So you're going to reset stuff, reconsider things, go back into your kick, reconsider things there. We're going to boost around 80. Sure, let's do a cut. We're going to reinforce some of the moves we made earlier. So, okay. And you got to keep in mind, of course, all the other frequencies you probably intend to use. Now we're going to do the snare. So first we're going to take our, my snare sounds like this and let's, uh, let's just clone it. So we're going to hit alt C, alt C, and then we're going to hit alt and just bring it on down below our kick. We're going to put it on its own channel, hit control L. Hold shift and drag with your mouse over the name to move it. And now it is in its own channel. It's on channel 323. That's what it sounds like. I originally, it was like that. So I had a little more release. I wanted it a little bit tighter. That's the sound I settled on. And so one of the things about Noisia that he does is he will oftentimes throw a convolution reverb over something and mess with it. Now, the thing about the way I used convolution, what the junk this is why I like using just this. I'm really enjoying this convolution reverb. There it is. It uses an IR sample to generate a type of reverb to recreate a space. Uh, we're not, I'm not going to get into the details about convolution and all that mumbo jumbo and reverb and stuff. What we're going to do is we're just going to experiment. So if you hit here, you can uh, go straight to the uh, IR folder, if you right click it, it'll pop up impulses. So and IR stands for impulse response. Right now, if we run our snare through it, uh, we're going to be dealing with the snare now. So we're going to put those down. You see, it's quite, that's not going to be very metallic. He uses this to get metallic sounds out. There's a couple ways you can do this. So I'm going to show you this one first, I guess. If we go to FX, you can look at these interesting impulse responses. What we're going to use is we're going to use the metal surface one. Now, he, he has a couple that he shows. 
I don't have any sort of experimental ones prepped, so I'm just going to run with this one and show you how you can doctor it a little bit. But having a whole load of sort of interesting impulse responses can make this process really, really cool. But for now, we're just going to deal with this. So here it is, and if we play it, we get sort of that metallic sound that is borrowed from the metal surface here as part of our reverb. What we don't want is this huge tail. So we're going to come down here. We're going to go to our volume. We're going to add two points and just simply silence it. And we're going to turn up the wet. And then you can mess with self convolution stretch will give you some interesting options and some delay, which will again have a similar thing to the phase effect. So you could set it according to whatever pitch your song is at or whatever and come up with something kind of cool. I'm not going to worry about that too much. There's a couple other options though. If you go here, you could get a uh, fruity delay too. Any delay plugin will do. Turn the cut up, uh, cut off up and we what we want is we want a time at like wicked fast rates. You can hold down control in FL to get small adjustments and you can get a metallic sound this way. This is the result of comb filtering. It might not sound as nice as you want. You could alternatively try choruses and flangers if that's up your alley. You'll get a smoother sounding sort of metallic thing. But convolution reverb, as you can see, is kind of cool by its very nature. And uh, yeah, so those are some additional options. I'm going to run with the convolution reverb. I'm going to just turn the mix down a little bit here. I'm not going to get into panning and space and a whole load of other things, but what we're going to do is we're going to now EQ it. We're going to just, well, actually, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to do cuts instead. And now we are going to uh, open up another contact. So we're going to hit F8, go to contact, whoops, did it load? oh, it did load it up. Open up the drums again. Now we're going to focus on the snare. And then, you know what, hi-hats aren't too crazy. I'll just show you what I did with the hi-hats on the other one and call it good. So what we're going to do is we're going to go over here to mixer, and we have our snare channel. And again, our, our settings are already there. They have these presets. They're all right, I guess, the starting points. But if you want to be specific, you're going to want to, you know, choose your own. Something cool about this particular kit is you have an A and a B snare. Whoops. So you can go A or B and you can see which one you like more. We're just going to go with A just to make life easy. There you go. It's almost always going to be a D with snare. That's like a convention. The octave it's in is a little weird here, but whatever. I have another note somewhere. Do do. Well, I move my snare. There we go. That's what I want. Now you notice this snare. Well, oh, that I just moved from the snare. We're gonna name it. So I stopped doing that. Snare. You hold shift and click on the nameplate to change names like that. So we could try B. And B sort of fits better, actually, you know, so we're going to go with B this time. Last time I just did A and left it at that. Again, we have to configure our, our room mics and the snare. I want the decay. I want it to be very... That's pretty cool. So we have high potential here. What we're going to do is you see our snare coming through. We're going to bring down the room and the overhead mid and overhead stereo. I believe it stands for mid. It would make sense. I'm not sure if they did like mid side on this and that's what they did or what the deal was. So this is like your side channel, but then you would need three channels. So I'm assuming the room is a room. I need to go look it up inside their manual, but it doesn't really matter. These are like your, your overhead and your, it's overheads and it's uh, your room mic. So it's not that complicated. I'm actually pretty happy with where it sits right now, but let's go ahead and turn these off. See how much they're doing to our signal. And let's just turn off the kicks for now. 
Now, the dangerous thing about this is that the snare might sound a little more full, but at the same time, it's eating up that mid spectrum. We might not want that. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the boost out here. And you see, it hardly does anything to our snare. So that's just unnecessary stuff. We're going to go to our cue, make it a bit wider, and we're going to search around four or 500. So just me or I don't hear any difference. There's a difference. Okay, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna do high mid. We just want a little bit of that click. And I'm happy with the upper end, but we could mess with the upper end too. We're gonna go to our transient master. I kind of like the edge it gives it. You gotta be careful about the whole gain thing here too. Um, which it seems like we're okay. I'm gonna leave the rest of it off. So it right now it is going through nothing. So we're gonna go through 11. We'll put it right here. Let's go ahead and route it through. Let's put it through 22 and see how it sounds with the other processing. So it kind of gives too much of a tinge to what we're doing. What we're gonna do is instead is we're gonna route it through there as well and send it out in parallel and we're gonna mix to taste. I think right about there is good. And so without wit, it's a subtle thing, but these things are all gonna be subtle things. So now we've got something like this. And what we're gonna do is we're simply going to go to our hi-hat channel. And what you can do is once you have your hi-hats, you pick a hi-hat. And this hi-hat has it all the way off. It's normally what it sounds like. It's hardly different at all. And what its job is, is to outline the beginning rhythm, rhythmic textures. And you come up with a clever velocity sort of contour to give it sort of feel and motion. And what another thing I do sometimes is I'll, I'll move them off just a touch. You can alternatively come into the, uh, there should be a delay thing somewhere in here. Uh, time, then that's gating, whatever. You can alternatively gate it yourself. And that's also a really cool option. But I, I as you can see, I normally just go in the piano roll and, and do stuff like that. You can find a pocket, very easy. So now what you can do is we are going to use this to outline our beat. And then the other thing I will do is you see here we have hi hat. And I'm just going to go over to, to pattern, what is it, pattern one? Pattern one, yep. And I'm gonna cop, whoops, well, paste it. Copy, go to pattern four, yep. And we're gonna go to our hi-hat again, just simply paste it. The hi-hat itself, I did a similar thing with the room mics and stuff. It sounds like this. And what's and you can see we're getting a pretty cool thing. Now you gotta start adding in basses and stuff and start changing things, mixing to taste. And by having this amount of control over your sound, you're gonna end up with something really clean if you keep it up. So this is what I did with this, uh, with the hi-hats. They look like this. You see the hi-hat has actually been brought down and I boosted up here, this is sort of an iffy move. Transient Master's on with the sustain all the way down and a little bit of attack, the EQ. Have some low cut, some low mid cut, some high mid frequency boost, and some high frequency boost. And it is going into the mixer track, F9, to pull up the mixer, to get some reverb. But this is a special sort of reverb. Oh no, you know what? The snare on this one has special reverb. I'll talk about that in a second too, just run you through the ideas. But anyways, this has 
really, this is earth, this is early reflections versus wet, which are later reflections. The decay has been brought up, and I believe I left most of it the same. I added, no, I'm, I'm not sure if that's default or not, but I know I was messing with the pre-delay, which is uh, here. And the diffusion, size is all default, so that's pretty much where it's sitting, and it sounds quite nice. Next, you just start mixing and you start pulling things up and down and setting levels is like the battle of a lifetime. And then you got to deal with automating levels and doing all sorts of things. So when you're automating levels, I like my faders to act as master volume controls that don't automate. Because if you automate them, you're going to have a freaking heck of a time trying to get rid of that automation because it's complicated. Want your project, as soon as it gets bigger, it becomes much harder. Same way with how this is sort of a mess as far as organization goes. It should really organize it a little bit better. But what the point is, you have a volume control right here. Automate that one. That one you can automate. That way you still have a volume control here. And you can automate this one independently of the ones over here. So you have no excuse for using your freaking master knob, your master fader knob as one. And it also gives you cool options when it comes to bus routing and stuff because you can also use a plugin. It's called Fruity Balance. I'm actually not sure if it's in my plugin finder. Fruity Balance. Oh, it's right there. Fruity Balance, there you go. So yeah, Fruity Balance is basically just a volume knob too, in case you still need one. So let's talk about some of the additional things I'm doing. On the original snare, I decided to get a little fancy. I did low cut and it's side. So this is only stereo reverb the sides. The mid is not there. It's just processing side information and spitting out side reverb. And I cut it so that it's only the high end. As a result, if we play the original loop, I got a little more creative with the convolution reverb on this one. But if I get rid of that, this into the snare specifically, this is without it. I get away with quite a bit too because it's on the side so it doesn't obscure what's happening in the middle. And I, so I could turn the err and the wet up, which are early reflections. The dampening, not the dampening, the decay I had to set for this was a little touchy. You want to get this just right. You may consider just using a delay to create a similar sort of clean sounding reverb, but it's cool to have just side information. And then I high, I low cut. I love the fact that they say low cut, not low pass. I think low cut is just so much straightforward because I guarantee you there's probably a tutorial somewhere where I've gotten it mixed up and I hope you just understood what I meant. So low cut. So there's only the high stuff's getting through and you see you get that sort of reverb that sounds, it's a band limited reverb, which sounds really nice and it doesn't get in the way of a lot of other stuff. And our high cut is on. So technically I do have a little bit of high cut, but you don't want that really extreme high end usually anyway. So that's uh, that's a good deal. Now, let's talk about some of the general routing, and then we'll call it even more good. So, anyways, that's that's how you make that's how you do that, and that's how I typically go about doing things like this with Studio Drummer. And now, imagine, because this is probably what that the what you were thinking if you made it this far in the video. Uh, you probably load up a channel, right, and you go through these groups. You see, that would, does not work though when you go about it like this. So what I do is I'll, I'll pick out my groove if I want to use the grooves and I will then set them. I will then split them. I will clone that contact like three or four times and then split it according to what I want. I'll, I'll treat the toms the same way too. So it's important to keep in mind all the tools that you have in your kit too. How many toms and stuff you're going to be typically using and this is a full kit. So there's a lot to sort of think about when you're miking up or mixing a full kit like this. Okay, now general things that I did here that you may or may not do. So anyways, uh, I really quick want to play for you too. Here's our first loop. I spent a little more time on the snares on the first group. And then here is our the loop we just made. So uh, as you can see, the snare sounds a little more dampened. I, I would go through and as I add in bass and stuff, I would go through and, and change that, make it, you know, more metallic sounding, stuff like that. If you're curious to see the setting on the convolver, this is what I settled on. Do, do, do. That's the volume envelope. Do, do, do. With the same with the same impulse and everything. So uh yeah. It's not quite as spread out. It's a little too transient for me, but that's also that's largely because of the impulse I settled on. So I would like to go through and find some other impulses. Contact has a whole load of them too. I should go through and find that out. You could probably add a convolution reverb right inside and it would be pretty intuitive. We could come in here, go to add effects. 
effects. You might need to come down here to send effects. Convolution Reverb, it's right there. Look at that. They do use it. And you can come in here and you can set in a Convolution Reverb here. So you can feel free to mess with their settings here. Uh, I have a video on this on the Contact from the Ground Up series if you want to know more about how to use this behind the scenes, sort of more advanced contacty type things if you don't want to use outsourced plugins or maybe you don't have a Convolution Reverb and now you find out you do. Okay. So what I'm doing here is I have two bases, one that sounds, and they're pretty much just presets. This one's like the Re-99 preset. And it's quite soft right now, I recognize that. So what it is is when you're judging the way your mix is gonna sound, you wanna be careful about using volume. So if you turn it up, you're gonna, there's a whole load of issues that pop up that I'm not gonna dive into right now. So you wanna listen to soft and get used to hearing timbre, actual change. You don't wanna be judging how it hits a compressor. If you really like the way it hits a compressor, by turning it up, you should just open up a compressor and use the pre-gain on the compressor and freaking make that change. Don't rely on a compressor like on the master channel because that could change drastically later. So you want to be careful of stuff like that, which is why people sort of frown upon clipping because of the way you may change a number of things in your workflow later. Not that it distorts. Unless you're using fixed point audio, then it could possibly be distort. Well, it would distort if you clip at that point. But if it's floating point, you're fine. So the bass, I made some holes and I'm simply side chaining just a kick on this one. I have another bass that's actually a lot hungrier. But on this first, like, yeah, it's so it's being side chained. It has a hole made for the kick. It's not a big deal because now this one has a spectrum analyzer. You can see there are a couple notes down here, but it doesn't play a huge role in the sound. I could probably take out some of the highs too, and it wouldn't it would just clean up the high end for things like the hat and stuff. But right now it's sort of an empty mix, so I don't need to worry too much. And the whole thing about the harmonic series, this sound has a very strong harmonic series. So I can rely on the, the harmonic series to give the psychoacoustic impression that there is a fundamental that is not being attenuated. But in reality it is, and that's why it sounds cleaner. And so you can use that sort of to your advantage. Just making room for the kick because I don't want to deal with masking which is another topic I'm not going to address right now. I'm running it through a limiter. It's just use it being used as a side chain uh, for a compressor, so it's not being used to limit anything. And it runs in, it goes into, and that runs out, and then you'll see that I have routed it out again. On this one, I'm compressing it quite heavily, 13.5. Uh, this thresh, this is the VC160 uh, modeled after... Uh, a live compressor, an actual compressor is very popular for, I believe, drum processing. But what's crazy about this, uh, there, yeah, I don't know the total history about this, but I believe Pro Tools has the VC160, but they have, no, this isn't it. They, Pro Tools has the uh, VC76, I believe. Yeah, the VC76. So what's interesting about that? Maybe I'm wrong. I need to go look it up. Anyways, different plugins, blah, 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 blah. What, what's cool about this is it does not, it has a, it automatically adjusts for you. So it's sort of very musical in that sort of sense. So I turned up the output and the compression. I just crushed it all, a crap ton and I sent it through a stereo effect. I just used a phase delay between the channels to create a stereo effect. It's actually a preset. And then I routed that out. And then what you do is you see this very low. That's just to taste. So if I take this channel out, and then if I add it in, it gets you that width. It makes it sound a lot more full. So when people crank it, that'll fill up the image more. Well, right now we're listening pretty soft too. But later on when we master it and do various other things, and this is something that I might change later. Similar idea going on with bass two. Bass two. Now I just added in those high strings. So those are like still experimental. I'm not totally happy with where those sit. But... I am crushing it a little bit, just bringing up the average level. It's just a massive preset. I forgot which one it was. Um, base two. This is base one, number one. I did an octave thing. There's, I'm not going to say everything that I did here. But anyways, this is the preset, battery acid, and I messed. I had to mess with the LFO to get it to sound in time. If I were to do this in actual track, though, I'd probably be a little more creative and not run perfectly in sync with what I was doing. So that's up, and that one is spectrum heavy, and so I had to do some unusual EQing 
to make room for the kick and just get rid of low rumble. I'm gonna, I was relying on maybe a sub being in there later, but I added in a sub, as you see, negative 24 with the amp up and the spectrum mode is on, which basically is a, is it filters out down to the low pass. So it's basically a low pass filter. And so it's basically a sub for me. So I don't, I have a really smooth in sub. You can hear it in there without that. You see that changes whoa. So I kind of wish I hadn't undone with that because that was it took that took some judgment, but whatever, I can judge it again. So I'm running it through a compressor just to even out more stuff, just to sort of make it just a flatter dynamic image. So it's not doing too much, it's just a little tinge, a little sparkle. And I have it going through a snare and a kick that are side chaining it. What I'm doing is I'm splitting the output. And I'm sending it out and I am distorting it like crazy, giving it a lot more edge. And I'm also putting it through a stereo effect, this time using a combination of phase and just typical delay. And what it does is, if I turn this off, that was the original. And that's with it all the way down there because the wave, freaking wave shaper makes it so darn loud. So honestly, I this is something that takes a little bit of touchiness to get it to sound just right. But that is what I did with those. And together, with along with the side chaining and various panning and stereo effects, I created what I thought was a pretty okay sonic space. <laughs> You can hear everything very clearly. The chords sit pretty well. I mean, it sounds really nice, I think. You can hear everything just sparkle. That's what you're aiming for in a mix. I could, I have a lot more spatially pan, spatial panning things I could do. You have compositional arrangement decisions that you could still make, and you have automation decisions you could still make. And that and all those things can dramatically change the, from where we're at right now. But the point is, listen to how clear everything is. The kick, the snare, the hi-hats. <laughs> If we were to take in, now I don't have all the routing done on these, but we could do similar routing with the kick and the snare and create a similar event. Now the hi-hats are pretty soft and what I might try to do is bring this guy out, which outlines the beginning of each 16th note for the rhythm as a whole. And then the other, the other hi-hats, the ones from the acoustic set serve to just fill up the space. So this has been sort of a longer tutorial, but if you've never done mixing before, I tried to say things in a way that you could grab them without delving into issues related or opinions. That's another thing that's really hard to avoid. I think my levels are pretty okay. I, this is one of those things that I will sit here forever and just change things just by a little bit. And the more you learn about mixing, like look, my snare is off just by a little bit and that makes it that much more clear as a stereo image. You gotta be careful about the way your headphones, how they influence it, your speakers, how they influence it. Uh, especially if they're sitting on a table, which mine's sitting on a table. I've done my best to decouple them using some sort of ghetto acoustic treatment options. But I also have to be aware of reflections coming off the front. But I like to mix drum and bass with monitors because no one, people like to feel their drum and bass. People do, people who listen to drum and bass on headphones, come on, you got to listen to it somewhere where you can feel it hit you. You know, that's how you experience the drop. You can't listen to it over headphones. It's just, you're ripping yourself off. Now it's important to check your mix and make sure things still sound solid, especially on variety of headphones. Like I have a pair of beats and I'll do mixing on those too, because they're pretty popular. So you said you needed perfectly even frequency response. What you should really do though, is check it in as many places as you can and make adjustments, average adjustments, giving emphasis to the places that you expect it to be played or your target audience those are the ones that you should mix for and then you make adjustments as a whole to make it fit everywhere so if you have access to a studio that's got really nice monitors sure mix there but remember people aren't going to be going to studios to listen to your mix with really nice you know thirty thousand dollar monitors you're just not going to do that so you want to mix it accordingly and uh, well you could say oh what about the club now that's like a whole nother story it depends on the club depends on if they know what they're doing they're all those sorts of things. So you want to be careful with subs and how you deal with those. But that's just general mixing rules. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Support me on Patreon because I really appreciate that. And subscribe and have a blessed day. It's um, by Goja. Get G-O-J-A. And it's called Ram. And this is mine. Now, now give it some listen. Separate it from the drums and stuff. 
The pitch, I suspect, is a ratio thing, but I feel like I have the texture almost there.